You're watching Murnahan on Sky News. Here's what we've got coming up. So this week in politics saw the death of communist titan Fidel Castro, the death of the autumn statement to be replaced by the autumn budget, and a toughening up on executive pay. Well, let's go over some of that news with our top team of pundits. We've got Kevin Schofield, the editor of Politics Home, Ayesha Hazarika, the former Labour advisor, and Sebastian Payne, political leader writer for the Financial Times. Let's start with Theresa May's interview in uh, the Sunday Times, shall we? Because we always jump on any bit of insight that we get into her personality, because really she's been such a closed book for so long. Did we, did we learn anything new, do you think, Kevin? I think it's interesting that her advisers are obviously telling her to sort of open up a little bit more, soften that, that image. You know, they've, they've been very, since she's been in number 10, they've really kept a tight lid on anything, really. You know, everything, announcements are all kept very, very closely guarded. Ministers are told to be on their best behaviour, don't say anything that's going to uh, reflect badly on the government. So this is quite interesting, I think. I think it just shows a more, a more, human, more human side to her and how her life has, has changed since she's become Prime Minister. She talks about how she came out of a shop the, the other day and a woman came up to her and said, my friends are getting married at the weekend. Can, you, um, can, I, can I have a quick selfie with you? And she had to say a message, happy wedding day, hope you have a great time. <laughs> Which, you, you know, she probably Not would be a deeply <laughs> uncomfortable doing that, but she just realises... That's, that's what comes with, with the job these it, days, it? yeah. I was also fascinated to, to hear that Philip May helps her choose the clothes. What an insight. <laughs> yeah. there, was a, there was some nice colour, actually, about her relationship with um, Philip. Uh, she sort of said that, you know, obviously they're a very, very close unit, and she, uh, there's quite funny things about how he's now having to get used to people writing about what clothes he wears and people having selfies with him. But there was also a nice bit of detail, I think, about her um, role as a, as a female MP as well, and of course she's the only like second woman to get into Downing Street, talking about the work she did with Anne Jenkin in terms of women to, to, to win in the Conservative Party, but saying that they had to sort of do it in a kind of quite restrained way. In the Labour Party, they're more kind of out about, um, you know, trying to get more women into politics. They sort of seem to do it a bit more under the radar. But it's good to hear her talking about being a woman in politics. And it made me think of the memo that went round Whitehall this week saying, don't mansplain <laughs> to the Prime Minister. And I thought, it proves you've got a long way to go when you've got the top job in government and politics and you're still having blokes mansplaining <laughs> to this you. This was a great story by uh, Sam Coates this week, wasn't it, from the Times, yeah. Yeah, saying that there were civil servants who'd been ticked off for speaking over the Prime Minister. I would not want to be in that position <laughs> having to try and do that. One of the most interesting things I found in this, which I've heard from other people in the cabinet, the first move she made when she moved into Downing Street was to get rid of the Cameron sofa and bring in the May table. And this tells you everything you really need to know about her style of governing. That instead of, you know, when you went in to see David Cameron, it would be, oh, let's have a sit on the sofa and a cosy chat and, you know, maybe a cup of tea or have a Theresa May. You go in and it's a big glass table and you sit at the table and you're doing business at the table and I think that really shows you how she manages a government differently much more formal much more about process doing through things through cabinet committees and less casual talk and I think Aisha's point on Philip May is very key here that um, the Prime Minister's spouse is a very interesting role because we don't have a first lady or first gentleman role in this country but Philip May is a very influential figure every major decision Theresa May makes goes through her husband because don't forget they met at the Oxford University Conservative Association. He's a very political person as well. And I think we see some of that interview that he's very much her bastion and top advisor. Yeah, it was interesting. I spoke to Damien Green a bit earlier on the programme, who, of course, went to university with no both friend, Theresa yeah. and Philip May, so knew them both. And he seemed to be saying that at the time it wasn't really clear which of them would go on to be the political superstar, Philip or Theresa. I think that's often the way with political couples. I mean, Tony and Cherie Blair famously, she at one point was tipped to be the one that would, would go into to politics. But I suppose um, the one cautionary note I would say is that w she is the Prime Minister. She has worked very, very hard to get where she is. I don't think we should have a situation where she's the woman, but everyone's going, well, she is a woman there, but actually all the decisions, don't worry, all the decisions yeah. are going to go through Philip. Or Tim Nick Timothy. Or Nick Timothy, he exactly. Been described, this is her advisor, of course, who's been described as her brain, which is, in a way, is a little bit... bit insulting, sexist, yeah. Also it's also insulting, yeah, exactly. It's insulting to her other um, Joint Chief of Staff, Fiona Hill, as well, who is just as influential, just as important, the Prime Minister's thinking, and yet the media narrative, the focus is always on Nick Timothy's role, and the fact is... 
they're both very important and Theresa May has a brain herself. She can make these decisions without her husband and without her advisers and so far she seems to be pretty good at it. Well, you, you don't survive six years as Home Secretary unless you're very, very good, you know, <laughs> yeah. so, and she's brought that same sort of mindset, I think, into, into 10 Downing yeah. Street, you know, as you say, very formal, very, very process driven, and, um, well, and she also says in the interview that she's having many, many sleepless nights over Brexit, which I can well understand. She's not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's almost like the impossible task, isn't it, of keeping everyone happy uh, when it comes uh, to Brexit. How do you think she's doing on, on that? Well, I think she's on a sticky wicket because I think Brexit is a huge problem. Clearly, there was no discernible plan for Brexit. Now, you could argue that's because it's a, a leap into the dark with a blindfold <laughs> on in terms of how this stuff pans out. But I think it is difficult for her. I think she has got to, you know, this... We're not giving a running commentary, I don't think, is a satisfactory line. As an ex-spinner myself, you say you're not going to give a running commentary when you basically don't have a clue what's <laughs> going on. And I think nobody's expecting sort of forensic everything laid out, but I think she's got to give people a bit more comfort and a bit more transparency. Because all that happens then is we overinterpret and leap on the least little thing. Like last week at the CBI, she said that she doesn't want a cliff edge. So straight away, that set of hair running over, we won't be out of the EU within two years, will there be a, a transitional arrangement whereby we'll still be there in maybe 2021? And then number 10 had to very quickly damp that down. No, we're leaving yeah. after two years. There's no question of us extending our membership. And this all comes from the fact that we're not really getting any hard and fast information, so we end up having to speculate. I think the key point they're going to lose control of this is when Article 50 is triggered, because at that point, everyone else is going to be spinning. So you're going to have Michel Barnier's team, you're going to have all the European leaders, the European Commission, the European Parliament, and they will fill that void. They will be beginning to leak and tell you how it's all going. At that point, Downing Street needs to have a media strategy so they can say to the British press, well, this is the Prime Minister's position, our position. If they hold that line of we're not giving a running commentary, yeah. then the running commentary will come from Europe and they will lose control of the story very, very quickly. So I hope they're prepared for that. <laughs> well, I think we all hope that. <laughs> yeah. let's, um, let's talk about the other uh, big news uh, of the weekend, which, of course, is the death of Fidel Castro. Lots of different... Uh, perspectives coming through in the newspapers. It feels as though uh, it's all black and white. You either think he's the best thing for, since sliced bread or a complete and utter tyrant. Uh, where, do you, where do we stand here? Um, I would probably go on the complete and utter tyrant point. I think it's absolutely disgraceful what we've seen from some politicians such as Ken Livingstone, Peter Hayden, and of course Jeremy Corbyn, who is the leader of Her Majesty's opposition, who said that talked about problems of excess and for all his flaws. This kind of language is just not acceptable from someone who wants to be Prime Minister of this country. Amnesty International, who has not been allowed into Cuba since 1990, talks about the um, the critics experiencing harassment, the politically motivated prosecutions. In the last year alone, there's 8,600 politically motivated detentions in Cuba. On record, there's 3,600 deaths by firing quad, 1,200 deaths by extrajudicial killings. This is a country that we're talking about a revolutionary hero here. It's absolute junk and we should be intolerant of it. And people talk about Cuba's economy as well. There was little economic growth in 55 five years of his reign. In 1959, the GDP per capita was $2,067. By 1999, it was 2300 That's a stagnant economy, and I just think we should be very clear on what this was. Castro was a brutal dictator. He was rightly shunned by the civilised world. And I think people in the mainstream of British politics and elsewhere, Justin Trudeau as well, who have been apologists for this man, should be absolutely condemned by this, and I think it's just unacceptable. Tell us what you really think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm a bit, like, a bit unclear there. Um, well, I, I agree with a, a lot of what Sebastian said. I think from the left's point of view, there is a lot of romanticism going on about how they're viewing um, Castro. And I think that's partly because I think that the left feel that they have a very strong muscular argument which is quite revolutionary the left feels like it wants to be revolutionary so i think that's why they are choosing to sort of skirt mm. over all the bad things you've heard a lot today from senior figures um in the from the left saying you know i know some bad things happened but it's the but it's yeah, the but yeah, you know the the, 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 yeah. the the left is very much like let's just like focus on the the but thing but i think you you can't for all the interesting history, for the fact that this was a very, you know, charismatic, interesting, heroic figure, film-like figure, 
these terrible things happen. These absolute abhorrent abuses of human rights were happening for, for, for decades. And there, you can't do a but on that. We weren't saying that about Pinochet. Kevin. And I think you have to be equal, fair. Well, well yeah. Own? Well, I mean, the, the Jeremy Corbyn statement that he put out yesterday was a kind of classic of, of the genre, really. I mean, he rightly says he's a, a giant of the 20th century. There's no arguing with that, whether you think he's a great guy or not. But it was the for all his flaws comment. I mean, just sort of dismissing um, the fact that, he, I mean, he banned trade unions, which you would think, mm. if you're a Labour Party leader, you might frown on someone who wanted to ban trade unions before you get to all the extrajudicial executions and the locking up of gay people, yeah. people with HIV who were HIV positive yeah. in the 1990s, they were locked up as well. All that is just swept away as flaws um, so that you can sort of talk about, uh, they always fall back on his, the great health service in Cuba and the great education system, which I think is overstated as well, quite frankly. So, I mean, there's an awful lot of humbug, basically, over the last 24 hours. Aisha, now we've uh, got you here, I'm quite keen to ask your thoughts on Theresa May's announced crackdown on executive pay. Some people are suggesting this is rather rem reminiscent of Ed Miliband circa 2015. As, well, as, as one of his advisors, what, what, what's your take? As somebody who helped write that tortured uh, predators versus producers <laughs> speech, it does feel like deja vu. It feels like there's lots of policies that um, Theresa has been quite magpie-like um, from, from the Ed Bill um, or you know whether it's the the letting agents and um, this executive pay but look the devil is going to be in the detail and these are still quite small policy things I think it's very interesting that she has moved away from having workers on boards which actually would have been something quite significant that would have been quite a radical shake-up of corporate government governance in this country. But yeah, I think Ed Miliband, actually, he's, he's, he's got quite sassy in his tweet game now, <laughs> and he's kind of calling her out on all the policies that she's, she's stealing. But look, the rhetoric is one thing. You've got to look at the reality of actually what happens and how much of how strongly these policies are, are implemented. Yeah, he certainly upped his tweet game uh, since the 2015 <laughs> general election. I'm not sure he's had some kind of personality transplant or something. Um, Sebastian, um, I'm interested what your views are on, from the Financial mm. Times sort of perspective on this. Do you think that these kind of policies could be off-putting to businesses or do you think that actually it's all about giving people more faith in the capitalist system? So I think there's obviously a bit of both here. Um, I think this government actually went a bit too too far in the wrong direction. And when Theresa May gave that speech at Conservative Party conference where she lambasted citizens of the world, which dare I say to our Financial Times readers, <laughs> um, it was felt in the city, hang on a minute, what's going on here? And I think they almost forgot a bit that they were Prime Minister because Theresa May has given a lot of tub-thumping speeches at the Tory conference for years and then only picked up, you know, by the Daily Mail, the Daily Telegraph, and they do well. The fact was that speech was watched by every capital city in the world. And from Germany to Tokyo, they looked at this and thought, what kind of Prime Minister? There is this, like London's meant to be a city of finance and there has been a recalibration. So her Mansion House speech, her CBI speech, we've got this executive pay stuff and we've got the industrial strategy. I think that's a certain way to say, okay, we do want to work with business, we do want to be friendly. And that's an approach that we've welcomed in our, uh, in our leader column. And I think we do, you know, we acknowledge that business isn't very well liked and there does need to be reforms of the kind that Aisha was talking about. But at the same time, um, you know, we, we, given Brexit, we can't just close up to business entirely and we need to get that balance right. On the workers on board things, one quick point I want to make there, Theresa always said representatives of workers on boards and her language could imply workers on board, but she never actually said workers on boards here. So it could be a certain director who's responsible for that. So it was seen as a U-turn, not quite sure it was a U-turn. Okay, well great as always uh, to discuss uh, the week with the three of you. Thanks very much for coming on.